I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's block we call Low-Key Christmas Movies. While we all know It's a Wonderful Life, Miracle on 34th Street, and A Christmas Story are all, well, Christmas stories, there are films out there that keep their holiday spirit a bit more subdued. Just like Santa on Christmas night, their statuses as Christmas movies tend to stay under the radar. While searching for the perfect gift, not to mention hawking some of his half-baked inventions, Rand Peltzer purchases a cute little rodent-like creature and brings it home to his adult son, Billy. Along with the animal comes a specific set of rules that if aren't followed, could unleash a horde of little green monsters just in time for Christmas. Zach Galligan and Phoebe Cates star in Joe Dante's Gremlins from 1984. In Gotham City, the annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony keeps getting interrupted by cats, bats, carnies, rocket-mounted penguins, and evil department store moguls. Will the stinking city ever be able to light their tree, or will they get played like a harp from hell? Michelle Pfeiffer, Michael Keaton, Danny DeVito, and Christopher Walken star in Tim Burton's Batman Returns from 1992. Teaching himself the art of fodging checks, a young Frank Abagnale Jr. cons his way into becoming a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, and a commercial pilot logging over 2 million air miles, all while cashing $4 million worth of forged checks. Hot on this paper hanger's tail is a G-man who makes catching Frank his main priority. Well, that and making sure he and Frank have their annual phone call on Christmas. Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Hanks, and Christopher Walken star in Steven Spielberg's Catch Me If You Can from 2002. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Happy Holidays. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. From those of us at City Hall to each and every one of you, happy holidays. Will you welcome, please, Gotham's own Santa Claus, Max Shrek. All right, welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster, and with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are you? I, I forgot my speech. Uh, remind me to take it out on what's-her-name. <laughs> I thought you were going to give me a knock-knock joke. <laughs> knock, knock. <laughs> Go fuck yourselves. Today we're going to be talking about low-key Christmas movies. Yeah. Gremlins from 1984, Batman Returns from 1992, and Catch Me If You Can from 2002. Exciting stuff. I agree. I would say that... Um, Obviously, two of these films are, are some of my favorite films from childhood. I've probably seen them well over hey, 20 hey, times. Hey, you can't do that to and Ricky! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I mean, let's get into Gremlins. Um, we, we already did the sequel to Gremlins on this, on this show and talked about how much Joe Dante can really nail, I guess, live-action cartoons, um, I guess yeah. is an easy way to say that. Right. And you can really see that a lot in this movie and rewatching it. I hadn't seen it in a few years. Rewatching it, there are those moments in there that he just background things happening that right. you'd never expect in the movie, but like the time machine <laughs> disappearing in the background of the inventor's convention. <laughs> oh, man, I, I, I missed that one. While <gasps> well, he's on the phone. Uh, yeah, the exactly, <laughs> when he's calling back home and like all those like classic things and Spielberg rolls by in a in, a, in like the ro- robotic wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. I have to look at that scene again. Oh, man, no way. Totally. Really? Am I blowing totally your mind right it. now? <laughs> That's awesome. The convention's great. Actually, the competition is... Uh... Sorry, this... I'm just a little more advanced than I expected. It's just like one scene he's talking, he's there, and then the next scene there's like a puff of smoke and people are like looking for him. It's hilarious. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, Gremlins uh, definitely takes place around Christmas, um, but yeah. it's definitely not a Christmas movie. Is that true? I mean, it's like, you know, there, there's holiday songs playing all the time and... And the, yeah, the Gremlins yeah, the, the, do Carol. <laughs> yeah, uh, Phoebe Cates' Christmas story. Uh, that oh my she tells God. Like... <laughs> that needs to be turned into a movie. <laughs> Jesus. Exactly. And it's written by Christopher Columbus, uh, who, uh, you know, I don't know, directed Home Alone and uh, all kinds of Christmas movies, right? And who also dir- uh, wrote this as a much darker, more gory horror <laughs> film yeah. uh, before it turned into the family friendly fair. Right. Although. This was one of the movies that made the MPAA uh, question what PG and PG-13 meant. 
Oh, yeah. um, this one I, I, and I uh, Temple of Doom. Yeah. Right. I saw a little thing about that. That yeah, that these back to back in whatever 1984 was like. <laughs> okay, we got to figure something else out here. There's got to be something a little in between there <laughs> for microwaving gremlin heads and. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The microwaving and the blowing up of the gremlin probably is the one that set people off. They're like, oh, okay, uh, we might need to reevaluate this rating system yeah. thing. <laughs> I, I always kind of forget about the the bookends. Mm-hmm, me and too. So like the ending bookend, you know, it has that sort of Thomas Kincaid painting that the guy <laughs> exactly. like walks through, and like, and we've got you know, you never uh, know, you might have gremlins. <laughs> we got uh, yeah, Rand, uh, you know, doing some <laughs> some voiceover uh, to to start it and to end it, and then yeah, like so so the very beginning. It starts off in sort of uh, big trouble in little China, like a, a backlot Chinatown with a lot of smoke and, you know, a lot of exactly. wet streets and whatever. Yeah. It seems as though his plan is to find the perfect Christmas gift for his son, but then he, like, immediately gets in there and starts pitching his products or whatever. <laughs> the smokeless ashtray. <laughs> the bathroom buddy. <laughs> the man at gas station tried to sell it to me. <laughs> He's like, that's no problem at all. No problem. The last at all. scene like, of that, it's fucking not working at all. That guy at the gas station, you see Rand taken off, and he's trying to go after him. This thing's smoking, <laughs> just billowing smoke coming out of the smokeless ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> the movie's hilarious. No, exactly. <laughs> it's got so many great little moments there, and you know, and, and because it's uh, Joe Dante, it's just you know, it's chock full of like endless references to other movies yeah and all these things joe dante you know breaks the mystery science theater rule of don't put better movies in your movie uh all the time but you know still gets away with it because <laughs> like, his movies are still good right and, and, they're, yeah. th- and they're that great they hold up exactly. to the ones he puts in there no but it, it, it is just one of those things where it's like you you're always uh ooh, it's dangerous to uh to <laughs> to go yeah. there and but uh yeah he gets away with it and you know in gremlins 2 they uh Gizmo like watches TV a lot in, in both movies. In the second one, he watches Rambo, and then like you know, kind of gets inspired by it. And like, in this one, he kind of does the same thing with that um, Clark Gable movie. You know, you kind of hear it in his head later on as he's driving the Barbie <laughs> car around or whatever. And Montgomery Ward. <laughs> a certain kind of gun. And that gun is a certain kind of thing. I really loved how intelligent he was, and all the all the gremlins really. That's what made them either so much cuter or so much scarier at the same time. You know, right? Exactly. The, the way that Gizmo would be able to repeat everything that was said, and he was like playing with the 3D glasses, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> neat. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was awesome. Every everybody was saying neat. That was the only word they knew in this movie. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's neat. No, it's it's really neat. Yeah, yeah. Corey Feldman. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no. Ser- seriously, yeah. I, I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't this cool? Like, this thing just multiplies. <laughs> yeah, he, like, so it's his reading comics. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go read some comics. <laughs> Bored of this shit. Oh, he is me. Well, wasn't this, like, Corey Feldman's first movie, or I guess one of them? Like, or, it's got to be one of them, yeah. Friday the 13th or something. I think it came out the same year. Because he looks exactly the way that he did uh, as Tommy whatever in uh, Friday the 13th 4. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Friday the 14th. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, how much do you love the Rock and Ricky radio thing yes. when, it, when it like cues up and like, you know, because everything before that was kind of the a prologue, you know, because mm-hmm. there was a lot of voiceover and like, and then the, you know, the little kid who sells him the, the, <laughs> the Mogwai for $200. That's $200. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mogwai not for sale that you know that kid gives him voiceover and so it just feels like a, a totally different you know separate little piece but the movie Looks actually too. feels like it, it's yeah exactly it feels like it starts at the rock and ricky uh you know like p- pulling out of the out of the little yeah. you know billboard and we, we see somebody decorating a christmas tree and like mm-hmm. then we see uh what an opening shot yeah not bedford falls but whatever it's called uh kingston falls and then it's uh of course would later become much more famous that plaza as like the back to the future right uh like uh oh geez what was the name of the back to the future uh town hill valley oh hill valley right right exactly mm-hmm. um but uh anyway so the so movie gets it started right there with uh with rock and ricky and and uh we sort of meet some of these cast of characters and including the uh the deagle <laughs> whatever it mrs was. deagle yeah or, or she's like Half, One of my favorite like, characters, Mr. Potter, half like the Wicked Witch from uh, from uh, <laughs> Wizard of Oz. 
Yeah. I mean, because, like, you know, she owns the whole town, but she's also... Where's like, your <laughs> dog? Yeah. She's also, like, wants to eat his dog or whatever. I'll kill the beast slowly. <laughs> the beast. It's better than what I'll do to him. <laughs> I'll catch the beast myself. Maybe I'll put him in my spin dryer on high heat. That'd do it all right. Just love how she gets it so bad, too, and... <laughs> Mrs. Deagle is one of like the ultimate villains in the movie, and she's one of those that gets the just dessert. One of those comeuppances. It's almost you know right yeah. in the middle of the the movie. It's great little. No, exactly. That's that's one of the few times you're rooting for the gremlins at that point. Like, yeah. <laughs> and they're they're all, they're they're caroling outside her house. Like they do, they do all those like human like things. They're just very uh, mischievous. Yeah. And I think they nailed that. And uh, Chris Chris Wallace. I've heard his name like pronounced Wallace, uh, the makeup effects guy or the creature effects oh, okay. guy. Um, but he, he did a great job on this one, but it was only his studio working on this one. The second one was like four or five studios working to Uh, to submit gremlins. Um, but I thought these still hold up. The puppets are great. Yeah. Yeah. I, especially like when, when you're first getting introduced or whatever, and it's like, you know, you see the hands pop up and then you see his head pop out of the box and, you know, all those little moments. And then like, you know. Gizmo is, is acting with the dog. I can't remember. What's the dog's name? Ralph? Barney. Barney. <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My dog's yeah. name's Ralph. <laughs> Wrong dog. Um, the uh, So in, in a lot of those moments, you like you really like feel like the puppets um, are, are you know working really well. I, I guess, you know, there, there are certain moments, I guess, when they're uh, up in Billy's room where it, it feels less convincing than it does in the second one. But um, in any case, I think because they kind of front-loaded the really good stuff you 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 just kind of like accepted it a little easier. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess so. Um, there there was quite a bit that uh, in the second one that's just far superior. I mean, like the motorization and the mechanics that are in the faces and everything, yeah. and they've got that one, the goofy one that kind of looked like yeah. Gizmo that <laughs> bing, and its, it's face like, is going all crazy. Like, like, all these <laughs> noises, like. <laughs> like I don't think they had anything that intricate in this one, right, um, right, right. but. And then there are some things that don't hold up either, but they do give the sense of scale of, you know, how the gremlins will multiply to try to take over the world is that wide shot um, of the street and you see like yeah. Stripe come up and he's like, come on. And then there's, you know, a thousand <laughs> of them that just came out of the pool. Um, right. That one kind of looks a little shitty these days, um, but at the oh, same yeah. time. When it, they're it, walking it, down the street type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it still worked for what they were trying to portray. You know, they're. These things went from one cute little animal to now a thousand disgusting green monsters. Yeah, yeah. Chaos. They're just agents of chaos. <laughs> they're, just, they're so great. I love Gremlins so much. Right. I think that anything they anything they do that that bar scene, which I heard was a nightmare to shoot, but it the bar like scene it, when like Kate that. is being just okay. ravaged by them, like <laughs> that one. They they've they've got all those little moments where they're just like. Just hanging with each other, you know, like, and there's the yeah. the one doing the music, and just it's so funny. It's like you know, yeah, exactly. The the, the gremlins are like sort of pure chaos or whatever. What, what, exactly. I, what I love about the bar scene is like just sort of like zooming out from that for a second. It's like. Phoebe Cates, I guess, presumably, like these guys just started wandering in one by one. It was like started feeding them and like, pouring drinks. Right, was she them. serving yeah. them? Because yeah. she she kept like filling beers. Like that was still her. She yeah. still had a job to do, even though all this shit was going on. You know, yeah, like, she was like taking all the customers seriously. And, all this shit. and it's just two. Like, you want you want yeah. two margaritas? Yeah. All right, I'm on. Right yeah. yeah, yeah. Two Miller lights. <laughs> but, but it's like. Also, uh, you know, you, you can't get them wet with, uh, you know, dirty paintbrush water, but but they can drink beer. Beer beer works, yeah. <laughs> the, and then all of a sudden, the gremlin pops out of the TV and starts eating me for questioning these things. <laughs> what happens if you're flying through time zones? What, what like, if they're eating in an airplane and they cross a time zone? I mean, it's always midnight somewhere. <laughs> I guess in the in the bar when they had the gremlin spinning on the uh, the dartboard and they were taking shots at oh, it, yeah. uh, that was something that I think Dante, Joe Dante, or maybe some of the crew or somebody was like, we need to do that because that's what they actually wanted to do to the actual mechanical pu- puppets because they were just <laughs> a, a nightmare apparently. <laughs> but man, they 
they pulled off a killer movie though even as 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 rough as it must have been shooting it it looks great everything comes together so great yeah no that's true and you know it's also just like you know nailed all the beats of the adventure yeah and all that sort of escalating you know moments of like you know, okay, they, so they started off uh, with only a handful of them, and there was, like, one at the school, you know, terrorizing the mayor from The Wire, and uh, one at, uh, you know, the, the three at the house, and, like, you know, and, geez, like... That one scared me, though, the, the teacher. That one, that one's a creepy... Oh, yeah. Well, because, you know, you were also, like, watching that horrible, like, uh, you know, nature yeah. documentary about the, the heart. hearts and the fucking... <laughs> boom, boom, the hearts, boom, like, boom, yeah. Maybe the esophagus and whatever, like... <laughs> Oh man, like, <laughs> so gross. Yeah, it's and, scary. <laughs> and even though you don't see the uh, the gremlin because it it had become a gremlin by that point, I guess. Even yeah. though even though you don't see it, like it's scary as hell. And like it, it or perhaps because you don't see it, it's it's even scarier. Uh, this is the pupil pupil stage the pupil <laughs> stage. <laughs> it's going through a lot of changes in there. Like my mother. Uh, no. No, that's different. This is called the metamorphosis. But then, yeah, and, and then you get that that horrifying, you know, just like um, you know, slasher scene with the mom, yeah. and you know, she, and I think that's three or four of them coming after her, or yeah. three in the in, that are across around the kitchen. <laughs> but uh, sticking with the mom for a second, like her. her really uh sort of horrifying journey like you know and she just became the sort of vampire slayer uh, the gremlin vampire slayer so badass the, yeah <laughs> the van helsing of Grem- gremlins like she went we went for the blender <laughs> we went for the microwave <laughs> and just like straight up stabbing him in the chest or whatever <laughs> on the uh, on the kitchen countertop there yeah and i mean van helsing. <laughs> <laughs> she was just you know she had, like went from like never knowing and like never seen one of these things before to like just <laughs> being yeah. their worst enemy. <laughs> I had read or heard somewhere that like you know during one of those shots where that sort of maybe famous shot where she like looks around the corner and sees the gremlin like you know pop into the blender or whatever that thing was. Um, the 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 Peltzer juicer or whatever. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> um, and, like th- that shot apparently was played backwards because they can only get the puppet to come out and not go in oh. or something like that. It does look awkward. It it looks a little weird, but I it somehow like in the moment you you don't even notice it exactly. until it's like, pointed out to you that oh psychologically yeah yeah that's backwards. Oh, I never even thought that, of that. That's why her face looks strange because she's moving backwards. But like, but. You know, when you're when you're watching it, you you just you feel like it's just uh, because her fear is so enhanced or something that like there's something off about it. You know, yeah. but it, it, anyway, it's like you know they get away with all kinds of tricks like that. Yeah. In the very next scene, I think it's uh, after you know mom goes to town on all the gremlins in the microwave and all these things that they pay off a uh, Chekhov ceremonial sword uh, hanging on the wall there. Yes, yes, I was going to bring that up because it kept falling every time yeah. someone comes in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then even when 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 Rand Peltzer yeah. comes in and he's singing <laughs> singing how yeah. Speaking of some of the the horrifying stuff uh, with with the mom in the in the in the kitchen there, apparently the original scene as written uh, went a lot darker. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, see, mom the, wasn't the so dog, victorious <laughs> dog was eaten mother was decapitated i believe that's how it worked out right. something they, like they that found her head like rolling down the stairs or whatever. yeah i think they actually like rolled it like as a threatening move like that's i don't think chris columbus wrote this script to be you know actually produced this sounded like something he was having fun with as a student because right. right. i think exactly. he must have been extremely young when he got this one written yeah and i and i can't believe how much of a hand he's had in so many movies like, oh yeah, he's been a writer on on tons. Even within the sort of Christmas canon, he he's got a bunch, right? It's you know the Home Alones. Yeah. <laughs> this was kind of the the movie where I guess people realized, I'm sure after his stand up, but still, Howie Mandel could also be a voice actor because he is uh, the voice of right, Gizmo, right? In, in his I guess few lines, but. Um, also, Michael Winslow from Police Academy is is Stripe, 
Um, oh, the one really? That Larvel, oh, wow. Larvel Jones. Yeah. The be- um, bleeps, the sweeps, and the creeps. <laughs> yeah, do all the machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> Howie Mandel doing the voice. Uh, was, was this before, like Bobby's World and all that? No, uh, but Bobby came from his stand-up act in the early early eighties. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, now he's associated with this merchandising dream. This yeah. this retail store um, plush that would probably sell <laughs> millions. You know, after this movie. Um, so yeah, I think that that's when Bobby's World came about. Which, if you watch Howie Mandel's stand-up. He is not Bobby's world. Yeah, like that is that is not his stand up at all. Like he was, it was pretty raw back in the day. It, you know, it is always funny like how uh, some of these '80s comedians, like, yeah, like Bob, Bob Saget? Saget, yeah, exactly. That was what I was thinking <laughs> of too. It's like where he was like, you know, <laughs> kind of reformed on TV as like a really family friendly guy, <laughs> like a stand up. Hardly. Ar- yeah. <laughs> come on, guy. Come on, kids. Let's go see Bob Saget at the live performance. Well, fuck you. you know? <laughs> Ooh. Hello. But I'm a happy guy because I, I got married. Married my girlfriend of seven years. That's her age. I'm going to jail. Interestingly enough, uh, Tim Burton was one of the uh, directors that could potentially have directed this film. Uh, he was oh, up. Oh, really? Because um, uh, that was when Spielberg had seen his short, that Frankenweenie, oh, okay. which kind of put him on the map. But then Tim Burton went on to go do, I think, Pee Wee or something after that. So it worked out for him. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Something you could share with the rest of us, Amazing Larry. It had been a little while for me too, uh, watching this one, uh, and it was uh, it was definitely great uh, revisiting. You know, I this is probably actually the, probably the first time I've watched it as, as sort of like a like a sit down as a Christmas movie type of thing, versus you know just an really? anytime Gremlins type of you know. I probably just watched movie. it every day for so many years <laughs> that it, it wound up on Christmas anyway. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is one of my movies, man. Gremlins yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah. Also, Batman Returns. Um, no, I, th- these are two movies that it was great revisiting because there was so much nostalgia fluid pouring out of my ears and eyes, <laughs> eye holes as I was watching these. Yeah. Stop global warming. Start global cooling. Make the world a giant ice box. I know I mentioned this on our text messages back and forth, but Danny DeVito absolutely steals this movie for me. I yeah. think he is... It's amazing how many actors were up for this role and how different of a role it would have been without him. However, uh-huh. he is 100% an, a penguin that I would see Tim Burton designing for. Very dark, very mysterious, um, but at the same time, extremely intelligent and an absolute mastermind. And yeah. it, it all works together. He's kind of a, a man monster, if you will, but it all works together. So in, in the first movie, they kind of have the Joker and Batman uh, have this, uh, you know, creation uh relationship whatever i created you you created me uh you know they they kind of did that thing in this one they kind of uh tied these things together in the sense that uh you know both the the villain and the batman uh in that they're they were sort of like uh you know both uh orphans or whatever and 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 having that uh rich kid orphans rich kid orphans exactly shows what you know mister to the manor born with a silver spoon. Oswald is Gotham's new golden boy. If his parents hadn't 86 him, you two might have been bunkies at prep school. Both 80s, whatever, 80s and 90s Batman villains in the Tim Burton world weren't just concerned with, uh, how do you say it, like uh, chaotic and, um, you know, wanton destruction for the sake of destruction or whatever. Like, that wasn't their only motivator. And, like, you know, and what was interesting in some of these earlier movies, like how uh, just sort of like sexually motivated some of these, some of these characters were like, mm-hmm. you know, Danny DeVito is super horny in this. I mean, the, the Joker in the, in the, in the 89 one was also uh, pretty horny. Whereas, you know, like you get modern villains today, all the things that they want are, are so, uh, some men just want to watch the world burn. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and, and what's great in, and sort of refreshing uh, in terms of a superhero movie with this is just how, you know, uh, his plan, however, you know, goofy, uh, at least uh, has some sort of like motivation <laughs> behind it. Uh, and, and it has a, a lot of interesting uh, character stuff there, too. All I want in return is a chance to find my mom and dad. 
and then try to understand why they did what I guess they felt they had to do to a child who was born a little different. Uh, this is the first time I noticed uh, something funny in this movie. Uh, obviously, as we know, uh, Danny DeVito would go on to uh, you know be in all kinds of things, including uh, Sunny. Uh, where it's always sunny in Philadelphia. And uh, one of the acrobatic clowns yeah. that steals the baby at one point and says, uh, I'm not one for much for yeah. speeches, so I'll just say thank you. That is Mac's dad in Wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gregory Scott Cummins is his name. I'm not really one for speeches, so I'll just say thanks. And again, playing the old uh, Six Degrees of uh, Patrick Cady. Uh, he's on Bosch oh my God. <laughs> that uh, you know, Patrick worked on for a long time. Yeah. Right. You didn't do it, right, Dad? No. Right. I knew it. And then on top of that, I guess the guy who was the organ grinder, uh, what's his last name? Like Schiavi oh, yeah. or something? Vincent Schiavelli. Vincent Schiavelli. He and uh, Danny DeVito go way back, right? Didn't they do the first movie together? Uh, Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah. We want the big guy, the guy who runs the show. What do you want? Not you! Shrek! I feel like in the first Burton Batman, they didn't have as many bright colors, you know, things were a little more muted. It wasn't so much a Burton movie as this one was, I'd say. Yeah, I, I don't know, I mean, it's just like a, a, a slightly different aesthetic. It feels like they're like, uh, oh, we should make it a little more kid-friendly for toys and shit. And they did that simply by just, like, adding more colors to it. As opposed to sort of the more desaturated palette that's in the previous movie. However, I, I don't feel like this is a, really a kid's movie. Absolutely <laughs> it's, not. It's so you've got all these bright colors, you've got all these bright characters, and then you've got close-ups of people being thrown out of windows and those nasty like close-ups that they've got. Like yeah. oh the ice God. princess. Their head's like... Dun, 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 or the, dun, dun. the ice princess. Oh, yeah, you see too, her whole right. face and like her whole expression the whole way down. And then when... When Selena gets thrown out of the window by Max Shrek, um, he's like laughing. If she tries to blackmail me, I'll push exactly, her out of a higher yeah. window. <laughs> I love how I love he's such a gangster in that movie, and his son is that gigantor <laughs> guy, that huge Oh ass. my god. I just love I love those two in, on screen together. He was like Zangief in Street Fighter. Like uh, I was like, who is that guy? He I was Zangief from Street Fighter. And apparently Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was that. And then he was um the in all the remakes of Texas Chainsaw, he was Leatherface, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah. You'll have to go through me. Ooh. Chip. That go. Save yourself. I, I love uh, Max Shrek's look. That that feels very Tim Burton to me. Like, you could see... Oh, God, the hair. I don't know if you've ever yeah. seen, like, those behind the scenes of, like, Tim Burton movies when you see his sketches, uh -huh, yeah. you know, when he's trying to design <laughs> things. I can see that being one of them, you know, like, with big, almost, like, large Marge looking, you know, with the, the, the hair and <laughs> yeah, everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I'm, he's just so, like, bigger than life. And it's Christopher Walken who just rocks it. Who'd have thought Selena had a brain to damage? Bottom line, she tries to blackmail me. I'll drop her out a higher window. For as, um, I don't know, lighter uh, colored and, you know, more kid-friendly as the color palette and some of the, the, like, the big present that blows up and clowns go flying out of it or whatever, it's like... That's okay, an awesome all, shot. all that stuff is like okay. It's, it's very seems like it'd be kid friendly, right? However, there's a bunch of stuff in this movie that like you know I, I wouldn't so, sort of classify that same way, and I think is less uh, kid friendly than the sort of dark and grim, having no fun at all Batman movies that we get in the 21st century, uh, where you know it portends to be realistic, but obviously it's not. In this one, it's just as sort of unrealistic, I guess. Uh, but at least it's having fun with this stuff. And right. I think it's it's sort of less kid-friendly, despite its sort of aesthetic. I mean, you, you think about like how uh, the fate of Max Shrek uh, and his like you know Brutal. <laughs> his, his burnt like face and you yeah. know it kind of looks like the Indiana Jones thing, or or actually like in the first one they had the the burnt yeah guy. exactly like, the, kind the, of the the buzzer yeah the handshake buzzer yeah. <laughs> yeah so it was kind of a similar Put her there yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah very dark ending for that guy um, and then you know kind of like what you were describing with, with some of the the women falling to their death or Selena Kyle is 
a, the Walking Dead in this movie. If yeah. If you like look into that, like she's brought back to life by the power of the nine lives. I guess both women fall and they both die, but she's sort of resurrected Pet Cemetery style and kind of awesome. comes back as sort of the evil gauge. You know, it's like <laughs> exactly with the scars and everything. You know, like they added just details on her face. Right. Exactly. And and then you know what's interesting is like she had sort of sort of pre uh resurrection and and you know and in the selena days she was uh she did have kind of a dark streak to her you you saw how she dealt with that guy that you know uh batman saved her from and you know she had that got that look on her face and she zapped his ass and like (laughs) but it was but she couldn't she couldn't really channel it yet yeah exactly and then after being resurrected and becoming the 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 evil uh selena or whatever like she was just the opposite where she was like sort of always channeling that that dark streak and then having to fight against it uh interestingly enough you know and and that's how you get some of those scenes where it's like they're they're dancing at the uh rick james eyes wide shut party uh you know (laughs) but they're the only two without masks on right exactly doesn't matter who's man does to me you on you know that's how you get that awesome scene where they're they're at the as i shot party there and mm-hmm. you know she's kind of fighting against all these things but even in that stuff like there's there's tons of uh stuff that sort of continues this uh theory of the movie being you know less kid friendly than the nolan batmans or whatever so uh no hard feelings then actually Semi-hard, I'd say. Well, and then the penguin and her, he had his <laughs> sexual advances toward her that were right Just on the, the nose. Just the pussy I'm looking for. and Right, I mean, that was that's not a kid's line. You and I have something in common. Mm-hmm. Sounds familiar. Uh, wait, don't tell me. Naked sexual charisma. Batman. It wasn't long before that that he was just eating a, a raw fish with his with his <laughs> flippers and just oh god, I hated. It. It's hard to watch that. Still, uh, that my <laughs> nose to be gushing blood. <laughs> Not a lot of reflective surfaces down on the ceiling, yeah. huh? <laughs> <laughs> Still, could be worse. My nose could be gushing blood. <laughs> oh, your nose could be. What do you That scene where um, Michelle Pfeiffer or Catwoman puts the bird in her mouth, that yeah. was a legit scene. She really put a bird in her mouth. What? That, that wasn't like a prop? <laughs> yeah, she put a bird, a live bird in her mouth. A lot of the sort of practicals and stuff, I mean, even, I, mean I know some of those emperor penguins uh, were, were, you know, costumes, but like, I feel like some of the other shots of... Uh, some of the penguins, right? I mean, they did have some live penguins around. They on they set, brought right? in like a ton of the legit emperor penguins, and they had to set up these pools and these refrigerated sets for them, their own trailers. <laughs> their own, they they were like transported through like a, a a truck with an aquatic a big tank in there. So they it was just like what. what I don't know how much that alone should have cost, <laughs> like in this budget. Like that was like its own company in itself, you know? Yeah amazing that was awesome. but yeah there were some real legit birds and then obviously stan winston i think did the uh the mechanicals the mechanical effects oh okay cool mm-hmm. but yeah i mean I, there was a lot of like practical stuff i mean obviously in this yeah. uh that um that worked so well you know there but some of the C- cg or whatever or compositing that they did like the batarang that goes around and hits those four people oh, and you kind okay. of follow the batarang uh-huh. i thought that still was a great shot that still worked really well uh-huh. and i think that that kind of goes along with the fact that tim burton is still having fun with batman batman's gadgets batman's things and then even the penguin had those kinds of things right and it was like they really highlighted some of their gadgets and some of those old 60s and like comic book type things and still could portray that in a world and make you believe it like unlike nolan where you've got to have stuff that's directly from the military (laughs) which is just as sort of like sort of absurd and comic booky but yeah. like, but with the veneer that like it would somehow be developed for the More military realistic. or something. <laughs> it's like I don't know. It, it is silly. Yeah, um, but I, I loved um, all the things that they had. I loved that battering shot. But I also loved the penguins' um, car that looked like the Batmobile, but like a one, a coin operated yeah. one. <laughs> and he had all control over it. Yeah. I, I thought that was just awesome. Like just 
great production design. No, exactly. Uh, and he's, he's like remixing the, the CD. <laughs> In the Bat CD yeah, player, he's even got the logo yeah, on the thing. He's scratching it's... the CD. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I had a couple other little notes on like some horrifying stuff. Uh, you know, the guy who gets uh, shot in the chest by uh, by the penguin is like, uh, oh, penguin, uh... Snatching innocent children, isn't that a little, uh... No! It's a lot! The henchmen and or other folks who get dispatched in 21st century Batmans, aren't they always kind of off-screen? And it's just like, you know, implied that Michael Jai White gets his face, you know, destroyed by a pencil. It's like... We don't really see. <laughs> he was in the room when that happened, but as another person. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, it wasn't him. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like, yeah, no, totally. I know what but, you mean. Or, or, or you know, he, he gets the. I don't know. He gets the knife in the mouth. I don't know. Well, he does get yeah kill, killed off camera. But yeah. but anyway, it, it's like yeah. it's always like it's always just very implied. <laughs> these things. Not in this movie. In, in this movie, yeah, you, you see it. Like the. Also, Batman blows somebody up. Yeah. Let's not forget that Batman does, in fact, kill yeah, somebody. But I, do, but I don't think that that rule was established in, in the Tim Burton Batman that he doesn't kill people because he killed the Joker. Yeah, yeah. And in this one, That's he true. loaded up some dude with a bunch of TNT and threw him down a sewer. Right. right. <laughs> I, I love that sound effect that they use. Now, here, I'll play it now. And then it's the sound effect that they use in movies and, and Spielberg uses this a lot is like this weird explosion sound uh-huh. that kind of sounds almost vacuumy, like <laughs> like it almost goes up at, at the end. Yeah. And it's it's that sound that they used when the body comes flying out of the sewer after he blows him oh. up. It's hilarious. <laughs> even even the dark stuff again, just to to button that up, like uh, the way the penguin uh, you know gets it in this one, mm. mm-hmm. sort of not only like he. Sits in the toxic sludge, and then you know his that you know greenish black, black blood spittle slash blood or whatever it is that comes out of his mouth. Goo. His his mouth goo is is this blackish color, but then like you know toward the end when he's got these cuts on his head, they're like bleeding red. So I don't know. I is it blood? <laughs> it's it's green saliva. But you know that horrifying shot of his eye open as he's sinking down in the like toxic sludge pool. And like the oh, man, the I black, you know, uh, you know, a squid ink is is uh, coming out of his mouth there. Horrifying visuals. Talk, talk about horrifying visuals, exactly, exactly. And it's it's not, um, you know, it, it has a much darker quality, I think, than even the supposedly darker and grimmer twenty uh, first century Batman's, where those fucking things are dark and grim and joyless, but they're not as um, I, I don't know what uh, fun. It's sort of complicatedly dark as the Burton Batman's, and they're certainly not as fun. Um, yeah, not even close. I mean, even even the deaths that you referred to there were very cool and looked great. Like the 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 penguins taking their master, the penguin, to his yeah. death and like leading him off, marching him off. I thought that that was very poetic, very beautiful. I thought the way that Catwoman just kind of disappears. She doesn't really die, right? Or she comes close. Right, he, he can't find her, right? Yeah. Right, so so there's that, like, moment where now there's, you know, that longing for those two that are, I guess, nemesis, but at the same time, uh, star-crossed lovers, yeah. if you will, right? Batman and Catwoman. They they want to be together so much, but they really can't. They're two on two opposite ends. And I think that they did that really well in this one. So um, even the violence and things like that were, were like, highlighted with, with fun and with brilliant things. Uh, filmmaking no for sure and, um, as opposed to just like seeing harvey dent dead <laughs> with the you know the half yeah. the two-face and that's like the last shot you know? yeah yeah you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain uh yeah speaking of that that they're kind of like romance slash uh nemesis uh you know relationship between the batman and catwoman thing you know this movie and the Dark Knight Returns, or what was it called? Is that what it's called? <laughs> it can't be right. What is the third one? 
<laughs> Whatever Holy the fuck shit. it's called. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> Batman Returns, Dark Knight Returns. Batman yeah. 3, yeah. <laughs> um, both of them have essentially that storyline, right? Between Bruce Wayne, Selina Kyle, and Batman and Catwoman. And yeah. in both, they both are at some fancy Eyes Wide Shut party. Yeah. Uh, with people, you know... Like, doing the dancing, the doing waltzing. Doing the sort of waltzing the... in the middle of the, the room. I, I think that's a perfect example of like you know watch those two scenes uh back to back and you just see how i don't know fucking superior <laughs> batman returns is like just just the way even the coverage you get to see their fucking faces and their reactions to what each other are saying uh it is somehow this like breakthrough in uh filmmaking technology that was uh that was uh you know enhanced in 1992 uh when they were able to like you know see what the other actor's reaction was to their line that they just g- delivered it's incredible so you're saying the the constant Wally Fister spinning around the uh, the people because he does that a lot in in those Nolan movies. Yeah, so, so exactly in, in that moment, I I believe it's yeah like the the camera is just kind of uh, spinning in opposite directions from the people right. dancing. Counter counter rotate. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, in this movie they had sort of two different angles, or, or sorry, they had one that was sort of locked off while they were dancing, and the whole room was dancing around them. And they had another one where they kind of followed one of the characters around, and they would sort of cut between those things depending on which reaction like they, they needed to get. Right, like a, a master to cover. Yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's almost <laughs> as if they, uh, you know, this okay. sort of more simplistic filmmaking actually it makes it more effective. But then on top of that, like it, in both instances, like it was you know like one of them had sort of meaningful dialogue, and the other one was like kind of nonsense about is this. Abisa or Abitha? Which way is it pronounced? Um, was that? Wait, what line was that? That was while they were dancing in The Dark Knight Returns. Abitha. I, I love the dynamic here, and like, and you see how sort of like you know broken up and and torn up uh, the, the the resurrected Selena Kyle character is, um, and how she's just like barely hanging on she's like well, who do you think you are and like you know i don't know and she's like crying while she's saying it and like you know she has that yeah. like, pulls that gun out and you know it's it's like you know she's constantly sort of battling with herself or whatever to you know find a way to be at peace with this and like she thinks the only way to do it is to you know kill shrek or whatever and batman keeps offering this her this way out and she keeps rejecting it and you know, perhaps she was right to do so. I mean, maybe it wouldn't have worked, uh, and and maybe her speech about "I wish I could live with you in that castle like a fairy tale," but I couldn't live with myself. And it's such a great line, <laughs> but it's like so adorable. It, it's also mm-hmm. like expressive of this character and like this character conflict that like you know, uh, it's just so well wrought in this. Well, and Michelle Pfeiffer does a great job of playing all the different versions of Selena right. Kyle. Yeah including the one that's kind of in between, like you were saying, that's trying to find her original self before she became the gauge yeah. version of herself, the dead gauge. Resurrected gauge. Um, interestingly here, because we, we need to bring up Dune on every episode that we are on, <laughs> Sean Young oh, right. was did like a ton of stuff to try to get Tim Burton's ear to get her to play Catwoman. Yeah. Like she created a Catwoman outfit and like she was chasing him around like production offices and stuff. Right. But she, of course, was Chani from uh, yeah. Lynch's Dune. <laughs> right. Again, it's one of those things where, I mean, seeing Sean Young in movies and knowing what Michelle Pfeiffer produced for this movie, um, I don't think you could have had anybody differently play the character because she is just so fantastic. And how mousy she is as, as Selena Kyle and, you know, kind of yeah. she can't even speak <laughs> up in those in those meetings. Um, I have a suggestion. Well actually really just more like a question corn dog <laughs> and she called herself a corn dog yeah but then she becomes catwoman who is just a, a completely different character on the all, a totally different spectrum and she nails that one too right i mean you're, you're so right about the michelle pfeiffer thing i mean it's like just steals the movie in in such a strong way that like it, it is hard to picture someone else doing it even though I don't know what, maybe uh, Sean Young could have done it. Who I don't knows? Know. Yeah. You know, it's just that like once you see it, you're like, oh yeah, no, no one else could have done this type of thing. <laughs> yeah. She steals the show so much that like you kind of like I don't know, don't have um, 
you know, there's there's like little spotlight left over for Danny DeVito and and uh, Christopher Walken in this because they too, you know, are, are are you know really bringing it with the sort of you know it's over the top in a lot of ways and and whatever else, but it's it is also like extremely memorable as such you know yeah and i think that again it's kind of the marriage of all of their performances and then you've got tim burton i'm assuming writing directing i'm sure someone else wrote the film but at least directing this film and he's able to give everyone their moments he's also able to deliver two origin stories in one movie and they're both really well done selena kyle we just talked about with the cats but then the yeah, opening of the right. film is the, the cobble pots Starring Pee Wee Herman, starring Paul Rubens, yeah, <laughs> um, who was actually it was going to be cast as Burgess Meredith was going to play um, the Penguin's father, but he oh, was wow. very ill at the time. Penguin's grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's true. Yeah, um, but uh, he pu- pulled all, all that stuff off, and he also gave everyone their moments. That's basically what I'm saying is that you know, like it's very difficult to do and to balance all those. But that Max Trek has memorable lines that you can always repeat. The Penguin does as well, yeah. <laughs> and so does Catwoman. I mean, and the scenes that they're in individually as well as together are also extremely strong. So it's just, it's, I, c- I didn't remember how good this movie was or how much I enjoyed it. I-, I loved it as a kid, but I always thought, oh, maybe it's just like a poor sequel that maybe I just kind of liked as a kid because I watched it all the time and it was Batman. I'll watch anything mm-hmm. that's Batman. No, it's yeah, really, right. really that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, that's the thing is it, it actually kind of, it, it holds up. It, it's not just, yeah, you're right. Like you, it's just a mm-hmm. nostalgia watch or like, Oh, I remember, uh, liking this as a kid and blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, so I cut it some slack or whatever. I, it's actually like, it's, it's, uh, it's a really good, uh, you know, adventure, uh, and, um, and has a lot of interesting themes, interesting characters. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. good at all. Let's say that. And, what it's an interesting little connection, I think, between this and Catch Me If You Can. Um, not only the uh, Christmas setting, uh, but also the guy whose uh, nose could be gushing <laughs> blood and uh, penguin bites uh, in the nose. He yeah, has he's a small like in the background. And Catch yeah. Me If You Can. <laughs> he's like he's like uh, like a concierge <laughs> or something. Uh, he's like, no, why don't you just cash that check at the airport? He's, he's that guy. Right. Uh, and catch me if you can. And then of course, obviously Christopher Walken. Sure. Uh, Frank Abbott now. Senior. Frank, yeah. Frank Senior, uh, who turns the, uh, bucket into cream. Another like amazing performance, but like it couldn't be more different exactly. than his sort of like, you know, uh, over the top and, you know villainous uh you know just like evil max shrek evil to the core you know and he's this really really uh earnest guy really not evil at all in this one yeah and you know he he has like heartbreaking performances at a couple moments and uh where are you going frank <laughs> you going to tahiti <laughs> everyone look look around <laughs> you're going somewhere exotic come on frank where are you going someplace exotic where are you going tonight tahiti hawaii <laughs> damn it couldn't get away without doing a christopher walken i do walken a terrible impression. christopher walken <laughs> friend of the show chris michael does a really good christopher walken impression he also does the uh mice right. churning cream to butter speech really oh, yeah. well he really nails that one we'll have to have him on to do that awesome what what an interesting movie this was. Um, I I admit this is the first time I've seen this, and I can't believe it because I really love Spielberg. Oh, really? And wow. Yeah, no, this is one of the this is the first time I've seen this. I I definitely knew what it was. I knew a lot of the scenes just from being part, you know, focusing on the world of movies in general and and seeing you know clips here and there. Um, but seeing this all put together, yeah. wow, this was this is one of my favorites. Um, Tom Hanks is fantastic in this, and Leo obviously is incredible. Everybody across the board, mm-hmm. but my my favorite per, uh, character in this movie is played by Amy Adams. I think Amy Adams is yeah. <laughs> both hilarious as well as one of those like heart wrenching characters or character arcs that you that you get. And it's like she just played it really well. Um, yeah. This movie was fantastic, and this is definitely on my. You're not a loser. <laughs> Of all the things he tells her right there. She looks like she names off all these things. Like, wait a minute, you're not even a Lutheran. Brenda. Brenda, I don't want to lie to you anymore. 
I'm not a doctor. I never went to medical school. I'm not a lawyer or a Harvard graduate or a Lutheran. I ran away from home a year and a half ago when I was 16. Brian? You're not a Lutheran? Now, some people might, you know, use a name, but it's just a name, right? It's not really who they are, <laughs> right? <laughs> Amy Adams is like, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> I don't know anymore, Bruce. So this is a true story. However, I'm, I, I am reading here that uh, it was a little bit exaggerated for the yeah. for the movie, of course. Well, as they say in the beginning, it was only right, right, right. Yeah, a true story. But what a what a what a what a crazy thing to think about that at least the numbers were still accurate. This person stole nearly two million dollars in, in in fraudulent checks. I mean, that's that's a lot to yeah. get away with. Quick, why don't you let me write a check? I'll, uh, how much? How much does he owe? How about two point one million dollars. Alaska. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm sorry to have to tell you, your son is forging checks. Forging checks? Wait, I'm sure we can take care of that. Just tell me how much he owes, and I'll pay you back. So far, it's about one point three million dollars. Tom Hanks, man, he is the chameleon. Um, even though I always know it's Tom Hanks in the scene, he's still kind of blends in there he does this thing where his his body his voice everything changes and he becomes these characters that are just this is this is carl hand yeah. ready hand hand ready right? exactly uh and we also get uh the way in which the i don't know relationship between frank and carl uh gets expressed and like how both of them are are you know the two sides of the same coin type of thing and like you know, both like you know, super um, lonely despite uh, living, I guess, somewhat exciting lives. Both of them, in a way, it's like I, I know that they kind of want to portray Tom Hanks as this you know really mm-hmm. boring guy, and you know, like, oh, whose uh, red sweater is this? And he's like a laundromat, <laughs> and things suck. Wait, can we talk about and, that scene know, real quick? <laughs> yeah, the, go ahead. The, the cinematography, <laughs> the visual gag of that one. As they did the perspective, yeah. <laughs> the one point down the line of all the laundry machines, and all those tiny women are doing their yeah. laundry, and Tom Hanks yeah. <laughs> is a monster in the room. That is one of the funniest. Like, I, <laughs> right. I couldn't stop laughing watching that scene. Oh, and also he has he has nothing but like you know, a load of like twenty five shirts, twenty five white. And they shirts all come out whatever. red, all all turn pink or whatever. Whose is this? And she just takes so, it know, from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She didn't say anything. She just snatched it. <laughs> but uh, okay, so you know he's he's like, oh, he's living this like schlubby lifestyle or whatever. But you know, however, he's also traveling yeah. all over the place and uh, going to Montrachard, France, or whatever. And uh, Montrachard, yeah. Every single place that uh, that Leo's character goes, he's on the on the hunt for him, and he's he's like an know, international special agent. Like if you. Yeah, so yeah, it's like you know, he's still, awesome. you know, I, I guess what 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 I'm trying to say is like that, you know, I both of them have these uh, very sort of uh, exciting, um, you know, bouts in their lives, but then there's also this like downtime where they're both like super depressed or whatever and just like you know super lonely. It, Frank, it's because you know he can't tell the truth to anybody, uh, which is why he he keeps uh, calling Carl to uh, to you know have that sort of contact on Christmas. Why is it always on Christmas? Yeah. And like sort of through their sort of loneliness, we, we get to see like, you know, how sort of similar they are in, in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, and Tom Hanks uh, kind of becomes this other, you know, parent surrogate. I, I won't say father figure because, you know, for the longest time, you know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is still in touch with right. his dad and all these things. But I would uh, say Tom movie. Hanks looks at him as a son figure. Right, exactly. But, and But like both of them are kind of estranged from right. that other figure so it's like tom hanks is estranged from his mm-hmm. daughter uh you know leo's estranged from his, his father with one another they can sort of be honest the way that they can't be with other people you know his 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 daughter for instance uh carl hanratty's daughter um who lives in chicago and like you know that all the all this stuff and what's kind of interesting is like you know while we do spend a lot of time with hanratty and the the Hanks character, you know, it's this movie is very much the Frank Abagnale Jr. My name is Mr. Abagnale. That's Abagnale, not Abagnale, not Abagnale, but Abagnale. We do spend a lot of time with that character, and it's essentially like his movie, right? Uh, it's just that you know, uh, 
the Tom Hanks character has a, uh, a, a you know significant mm-hmm. part in that. They structured the movie in a way where we get to meet both of them right off the off the bat by having it you know start uh, whatever six years in the future, and then we re- rewind the tape back to when uh, Frank was in high school and. Having to, which wasn't long, you know, down, which wasn't that long and, yeah. until before he was. I mean, he did all this stuff when yeah. he was seventeen or eighteen years old. So right, he went to prison. Right. What when he was eighteen, nineteen, to this uh, French pri- yeah. French prison, and supposedly nineteen is is when because uh, on that like game show thing in the beginning. They God, said he was I love 19. that lead into anyway. the intro of the character yeah. uh, to tell a lie or to tell the truth. Yeah, right, right. Oh right. man, that was right. amazing. No, that was great. And they even had like the old actors ask a question, but like splice that in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. What was great was how they, uh, yeah, exactly. Like they they set the period, you know, because, okay, the movie starts off with the, the Saul, Saul Bass uh, like yeah. uh, opening, which uh, I'm sure became the, uh, like a template for people for the longest time, like, you know, using that as like in their lookbooks and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of like catch me if right, you can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it just, you know, it it looked awesome, and it obviously was sort of a throwback to Saul Bass, and then, you know, it set up where in time mm-hmm. and space we were, and then that game show did the same thing, mm-hmm. um, in in sort of a more real world way, and so you're not like, well, why is everyone wearing trench coats and <laughs> hats and stuff, <laughs> you know? But anyway, they, they did they did such a great job of all that, and then we start getting into frank's life and like you know they, they do such a good job of like i don't know setting up you know the relationship with uh frank's mom and dad mm-hmm. and like how you know and james brolin think about, think, <laughs> yeah 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 exactly <laughs> and josh brolin's dad yeah. and uh think brutal. about how much we, wait <laughs> you don't know the rotary club they're brutal um think about how much you know uh about frank's mom just based on you know how little we see. I mean, like, you know, she's only in a, a handful of scenes, but early on when Frank's dad is trying to charm the bank or whatever, he does a lot of the scams that then Frank Jr. would then go on to do for the next couple of years. Uh, Did you drop yeah. this out in the parking lot? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's next? Okay, stop grinning. When I get inside, you go back to the front seat and wait. Even if a cop comes and writes you a ticket, you don't move the car. Understood? Watch this. The manager of Chase Manhattan Bank is about to open the door for your father. Even though we spend a lot more time with uh, sort of Frank Sr. than we do Frank's mom, um, you know, we do get to see that, like, there was this period of time where it's like, hey, Christopher Walken had a lot of that built-in charm or whatever, and you know, seem to have uh, been the most uh, convincing soldier. So they crammed two yeah, hundred we soldiers. know the story, Daddy. It's like <laughs> tiny social hall, and, and the first person to walk on stage is your mother. And I turned to my buddies and I said, I will not leave France without her. And I didn't. As soon as uh, that accountant uh, screwed up his books or whatever, uh, and... Right. He's fallen on hard times. Uh, she's uh, off to the next, the president of the Rotary Club or whatever. Yeah. So, so you get to know a lot about the, all that dynamic and, and all that sort of backstory that sort of fuels this guy. And, you know, so that when you get to that scene where he's, you know, escaped from the plane and, uh, you know, ran to his mom's house. Uh, and he's like, wait, who's, th- who's this little girl? Uh, where's your mommy? over there it's your mommy too buddy and he's like all right screw it take me to jail <laughs> yeah that was the give up yeah. moment right yeah. there I, I i think all the cops showed up there too right to, to yeah yeah they found him there right they cornered him yeah. the car get me in the car please get me in the car you know the movie uh is on the longer side but then you know you you love that you want to stay in that adventure zone the whole time yeah. and it's like it, it's so much fun like watching how uh you know effortlessly seeming anyway he he weaves through all these situations and and finds these nooks and crannies to like uh, exploit and have a lot of fun with it and then you also like it doesn't like let that off the hook you know and it shows the sort of 
coming down from that high and like, you know, how he's like, you know, it's like it's oftentimes around Christmas and he's like sitting around peeling those labels on his like fancy hotel room and just completely miserable. you know Yeah. And, and lonely and everything. But then Carl also is just decides to fill in for the, for the guys that want to be home with their families. Cause he's, and he does the same yeah. thing on his end, right? He just sits there at the office. No, exactly. Man in the phones. Yeah. <laughs> This is Hanratty. Merry Christmas. I think this is probably the the lowest key of the uh, the low key Christmas movies that uh, we did on this one. You know, it's yeah, it's there and it, and sort of like in um, Hannah and her sisters, where it's like okay, we we keep like yeah. you know touching on these Thanksgivings. In Catch Me If You Can, you know, they keep uh, you know having these little uh, milestones of Christmas, um, but you know. It's uh, it's not always a Christmas movie, uh, I guess. The way that uh, you know, Batman Returns, uh, you know, ends on sort of like a what was the what was the line? It was like you know the Merry Christmas, Mister Wayne. Merry Christmas, Alfred. Goodwill toward men and women. And then you know, of course, in in Gremlins, the way it ends it makes you feel like it's a Christmas movie by having. You know, him walk through the Thomas Kincaid painting or whatever, and uh, yeah, you know. or Norman Rockwell, yeah. <laughs> or like just beautiful matte painting. Yeah, I, I did want to bring this up because you, you mentioned earlier, like how um, our good friend Janusz Kaminski, like, kind of had all these really um, wild camera moves in this movie, and like, and and I think it's it is one of those things where you just you kind of see how um much of a brilliant tactician uh, Spielberg is with the, the camera and it's okay. He's, he's got, you know, on every movie he works on, you know, at a certain point, you just unlimited budgets or whatever. And like, even, even something like this, that isn't full of, you know, dinosaurs and special effects and um, you, you know, you name it like on what seems like a um, lower key adventure movie than an Indiana Jones with boulders and, you know, Jurassic Park and all these other things. Um, he still, you know, spends a lot of time on all these these little these little moments. And in doing that, like it makes it much more adventuresome or whatever. Like, you know, it's not just like the master of the push in, the master of the close up. Yeah. Like it's just everything's punctuated so well when he when he when he works like that. And I mean he always works like that. It's just his his style is just that Especially those looks that people give and like those quick turns and they're like right in front of the camera right. and things Are like that. Are you my that. deadhead? It's... That thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Of course. <laughs> I'm your deadhead. Yeah. And I love how she like pulls the thing out for him. He's like wandering around the cockpit, doesn't know what to do. <laughs> the jump seat. Yeah. 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 And like, <laughs> but just like uh, in the scene with, um, oh my God, what's her name? She's uh... Jennifer Garner. No. Um... Amy Adams. Nope. Uh, the other one, cool. Who, uh, forty year old virgin, stuff like that. Uh, oh my god! Oh, Elizabeth name? Banks. Elizabeth Banks. God. Okay, so Elizabeth Banks in the bank. That's actually the the train station, uh, the the Union Station, uh, like the the unused little portion over there. Just the way that like we're kind of you know uh, strafing each one of the the teller windows, and he's oh, like man. looking for someone he can seduce or whatever, and to, to like talk them into like cashing the check. The camera goes up, you know, a hundred feet in the air and kind of swoops down into the the bank uh just to like show us that we've we you know time has passed but it's like this is like really like a, extremely um in in a certain way like unnecessary shot but it's like unnecessarily it's complicated dramatic. like yeah. unnecessarily uh, complicated uh, i should say sure yeah. but yeah of course it's dramatic yeah and and it creates that effect and it's great but like you know it is also like one of these things where like you know logistically speaking he, he does a handful of these shots that are just kind of insane and, and, and like the only reason for that was just to have a little transition to then show that oh he's back there and she's showing him the micker machine and you know it's like beautiful shot here's where we put right? these numbers and yeah exactly <laughs> and cannot deny the, the his cinematography well Janos uh, cin- mean, cinematography yeah. yeah no it, it's it's great and and this is also I think this is the same year as uh, as Minority Report <sighs> I, I guess I guess there's, there's another one where it's like okay you understand like, okay, that one's a much bigger movie and like, there's a lot of special effects and there's a lot of stuff going on. And like, and you know, so when, when you're on a huge level, you just see these like camera moves and stuff. You're like, okay, well that's fine. The, the, 
on on a regular you know quarter page scene of like uh hey uh, let me have you uh cash this check you know we're gonna set up a shot like this and like and do this crazy thing um you know it's it's more mind-blowing when it is uh kind of a a, a more modestly scaled movie well like you said with an unlimited budget you can you know take the time and shoot a page a day or two pages a day yeah, exactly. and like set up for those big shots uh, exactly. for those that one page well, and and even two lines of dialogue, like uh, Batman Returns, does some of that too. I, I think it's like there's a lot of these moments where it's like they do a shot of Selena coming home, putting some stuff down, and like here's the answering machine. She like, looks down and sees the or like or okay, as she's like cleaning up the boardroom, she like sees the speech, and in the, in the same shot, it kind of moves down underneath the table, and then we we get her reaction to a shot of her face in that same shot, and like you know. We could have done that. You could have done that with with two two shots or whatever, <laughs> but it's like you know, there's there was all these like little moments and pushins and and things that like kind of made the uh, the camera work a little extra, mm-hmm. but it also it kind of gives you that adventure feel. I don't know. I maybe all three of these movies are kind of like uh, Christmas adventures, mm. uh, maybe more so than just like low key stuff because like all of them like you know have this. We're still sticking with the title. That... We already recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> we are, uh, but. Uh, a lot of that that sort of like uh, camera work, I, I feel like, um, really exemplifies that that theme of like I don't know, all these movies feeling like adventures. Uh, next time on the show, we are going to be talking about movies that inspired The Matrix. Is this more like a George Lucas stealing completely, or is this really an inspirational type uh, episode? I, I guess we'll see. Uh, this this could end up being a little more like uh, Inception, where sure. you know some of the things were were taken blatantly, and then some of them are more conceptual. But uh, it it should be a lot of fun. I think diving through some of the stuff. I mean, you know, and with The Matrix. You can go in a hundred different directions, uh, but um, but this should line up with the new Matrix Resurrections movie that's uh, going to be coming out on both streaming services and theaters, <laughs> I believe, next week or two weeks. I'm not sure when that is, um, but very soon, middle of December. So yeah. it'll be interesting to, um, I mean, talk about Matrix, watch Matrix. But the three films that we're going to be uh, discussing are World on a Wire from 1973, Ghost in the Shell from 1995. I love Ghost in the Shell. And The Matrix, 1999. I know Kung Fu. All right, thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and give us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We will be back next week. Ciao. Did you ever get depressed on Christmas? I don't celebrate Christmas. Well, what's not to like? I mean, it's a lot of fun, you know? God! Say you hate Washington's birthday or Thanksgiving and nobody cares, but say you hate Christmas and everybody makes you feel like you're a leper or something.